Welcome back to Unspun episode 66. I'm your host, Jan Irvin. Today, I'm here with Jacob Duhlman. And uh, Joe Atwill is out today. His wife is leaving town. Unspun episode 66. I'm and I just got Jan feedback. Today. I've got to turn that off. I'm here with Sorry, Jacob folks. Duhlman. I got to remember to you the, to mute the the uh, YouTube feed because I had it up, you know. Oh, for the chat room. For yeah. the chat room, and I forgot to mute and 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 uh, pause the the video on there. So anyway, uh, Jacob, welcome back. I'm excited to have you back. You've made some amazing discoveries in the last week since you were here. And uh, you found a nice little, even a uh, nice little CIA document right off the CIA's website showing uh, Thomas Harrison's connections to the CIA. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some other goodies today. So anyway, welcome back. It's good to have you. Thank you very much for having me back. It's it's an honor. Well, uh, you know, and the whole purpose of this is to encourage people because obviously you just started digging in and you found a, a massive uh, rabbit hole, let's say, that uh, you've done a lot of flushing out. And, you know, it's just to, it, it's to encourage people to you know, to be able to do, to do that themselves and to not be intimidated because, you know, now you know what you've uncovered and you can see it, you know, and it's just, you know, and, and nobody can tell you otherwise about this research because you're the one who's gone through it all, you know, and it's, and they have to be willing to check all the links, read all the material, do all the stuff that you did to understand all of the material that you found, but that's just the process. And now what you can do to help others is say you wrote a book on all of this information or you come on the podcast and you present it to other people, but now you're sharing this verified research with others. So, you know, this way we're always encouraging, empowering others to be able to do this type of research and to be able to handle this, you know, type of discovery on their own and to not be intimidated. Yeah, there's certainly no reason to be intimidated. Um, just uh, it's kind of like lifting a rock and finding a bunch of bugs all about and they're scattering all over different directions and you're really curious about all of them. You want to know why they're there under that rock. So you go around trying to pick every little bug as it runs away and the one goes down into a hole and you follow that one down into a hole and you think it's a rabbit hole and then all of a sudden you find a cave system and that cave system leads you into a cavern and that cavern leads you into a whole bunch of different tunnels and I mean, this is, that's basically what happened. I, I, I started with Tom Harrison and I found a lot of information. Um, actually, just today at lunch, uh, I was just doing some, uh, some, uh, look, some uh, a look into his book, uh, Savage Civilization, on, uh, on his passage on Hollywood. And I got to thinking about uh, some, some research that we'll talk about later on, and some connections to Hollywood. So I started to look at uh, Alan Dulles and Tom Harrison to see where they might connect. And I, First hit was right on the CIA's website. <laughs> and did you Google that and it showed up on the CIA's website? Yeah, it was actually Google that uh, helped me out with that of all. Oh, wow. Companies. That's that's hilarious. So, well, you know, here, let's uh, I'm just going to share that document on the screen here so that people can see it. Yes, please and, do. Uh, you know, so this is uh, directly off of the CIA's website. Uh, the, this link is not. Uh, Jacob, you did send me the link earlier. I did have it in my browser earlier. But anyway, here's the... The document that you found, and it's the Central Intelligence Agency approved for release in uh, two thousand. I think two thousand one. I think that's supposed to say. It says uh, uh, two thousand and two. Or, or, or okay, yeah, o two. Okay, yeah, yeah. August twenty first, two thousand. Yeah, you're right. Reading that backwards. So uh, anyway, to Brigadier General F. Truby Davidson. Now I had Truby Davidson in the Brain David's uh, database. And uh, let's see. So, you know, and I did some mapping of him before. So now he was a member of the Order of Skull and Bones, and I had him. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't gotten that far. So oh, this is all. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're right. Yeah. Here we go. We're right into uh, the Order of Skull and Bones. Yeah. I'm going to pull up your brain database here real quick. I'm sorry and, for the connection. Yeah. Goes a little bit. And, uh, of course, he was a key figure to helping found. He was the CIA is under him. So that means he was a founder of the CIA, along with, uh, you know, people like um, Gregory Bateson and uh, what's his name? Uh, 
oh shoot now i'm forgetting colonel house or one of those guys uh you know anyway i have him up here oh uh wild bill donovan so oh. yeah so he's up there with those guys you know and uh so here's so here's brigadier general thomas harrison now he's of the British Army, so this is also, and I probably shouldn't give too much away of your research, but this is also exposing a massive collusion between the U.S. and British uh, intelligence communities. And uh, you know, he's he worked with Gregory Bates, and in fact, Gregory Bateson's right here. So you have F. Truvy Davidson and Gregory Bateson right here with uh, uh, with Harrison, and uh, you know these these ties to the intelligence community, the top brass or the top of the CIA, as well as uh, weaponized anthropology, which is actually further exposed by this uh, CIA letter. So anyway, I'm... <laughs> I mean, wow, I thought I found something, you know, big, but this is just getting a lot larger. I didn't have time to go much further at my lunch break, so I, I really wish I saw that. <laughs> Well, you know, and I was mapping a bunch of your findings in today. I only got, you know, 18, 20 pages through all the notes that you sent me. Uh, Jacob sent me about 30 pages, 32 pages of notes, but uh, really good uh, stuff. Somebody's asking for primary sources, please. We just had them literally on the screen, so uh, you'll just have to pay attention. Thank you. Yeah, just scroll back a little bit. You can always yeah. You can scroll back a little bit. You'll see the CIA documents there on the screen. So, um, all right. So, uh, where do we want to go? So, we're talking about the CIA document, and uh, you know, what do you want to discuss about it? You know, it's Alan Dulles is writing to Brigadier General uh, Truby Davidson, and we see uh, Dear Truby. I was uh, distressed to hear of your illness, yada, yada, you know, and these is sound like, uh, you know, kind of nothing here, but, you know, General Smith, uh, General Davidson has arrived in his absence, and then this is a secretary, and then this is General Bedell Smith, Central Intelligence Agency, Washington, D.C., and then, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, Walter Reed Wolf, Deputy Director, just to... Uh, uh, some note there. And this is F. Truby Davidson. This is to Alan Dulles. With reference to our telephone conversation of today, the proposed expedition to Sarah Hawk, which would be conducted by my wife and myself, would, uh, would under the auspices, would be under the auspices of the American Museum of National History. So here they're discussing using uh, you know, history museums, et cetera, as covers for intelligence work. Okay. So, you know, and we saw this before with Wasson and the American, uh, uh, what was it, Philosophical Society or something founded by Benjamin Franklin. But uh, here they're doing it again. And then it says, our contact in Sarah Hawk is one Tom Harrison, government ethnologist, and curator of the Sarah Hawk Museum. And then he's going on, I am enclosing a copy of the letter which has just been received by the head of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum. Okay, so here we see clear collusion between the American Museum, the Department of Anthropology, you know, and again, weaponized anthropology. We see the Sarah Hawk Museum involved in intelligence work between the British and, you know, British MI6 and the CIA, as well as British Army, since Harrison was Army. And he's talking about here, it admits that he's a government ethnologist. You know, so I thought it might be, uh, you might be interested in seeing Mr. Harrison's letter, F. Truby Davidson. So, uh, you know, it just goes on here, but uh, Tom Harrison, government ethnologist and curator, April 1952, Sarah Hawk Museum. Dear Shapiro, I had got a considerable way of in in investigating the houseboat and other possibilities and arrangements when, unfortunately, the political trouble struck out here. For the first time, there is now a state of emergency declared. It is therefore not uh, practicable to plan very much for the moment. For instance, all vessel, vessels are liable to requisitions, 
movement of non-official persons restricted and the general, general atmosphere uncertain. Moreover, I myself, having a good deal of experience in jungle warfare, etc., naturally am exceptionally busy both trying to do my own work and the emergency work. If, prop if the proposition continues at, prep at present, it is not unpleasantly serious. But at the same time, I do not think that any reasonable government officer would welcome a visit of the character previously proposed, and when you wrote that proposal seemed an excellent one. It is to be hoped that the situation will be much improved. Anyway, yada yada. But this is from Tom Harrison. Yeah, you know, and this is in the CIA archives, released 2002, August 21st. And, uh, you know, we can see the CIA's correspondences and notes in it, etc. here. But uh, anyway, there we go. Back to you, Jacob. Yeah, that's a pretty remarkable find to see that. I mean, that just kind of shows the cell right there between <clears throat> the British intelligence, because uh, mass observation in 1952 is pretty much in full swing, I believe. Yeah, you know, and I wonder, you know, since Wasson was a high-level CIA agent, we see, you know, Tom Harrison working in ornithology. I wonder if Wasson was. You know, they're both connected through Alan Dulles. Mm -hmm. uh, but... You know, they're both working on uh, MK Ultra projects from different angles, etc. And it would just be so uh, interesting to see if, uh, you know, if in my boxes and notes on Wass and if I come across Harrison's name or, you know, true BF Davidson to, to think about it. Yeah, that's true. It'd be interesting to see um, if there's any collection of Wasson's library as far as the bibliography that he had. I know some intellectuals like to keep a list of the books that they had in their library. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if there's anything about Wasson in that regard and whether or not he had any of Tom Harrison's books. And it'd be another nice little tie in there because at least he'd have an interest intellectually into uh, what he does as a man. So, yeah. It'd be one hey, little inroad. So, what do you think as you're discovering how weaponized anthropology works on the ground in Borneo? What do you think about that? Well, it's tough to really think about it because I'm still getting so much data. I mean, it's like a fire hose is coming in. I'm very much in the grammar stage. And as I apply logic to this, it seems more data kind of changes it. Um, but as far as weaponized anthropology of Borneo is concerned, I mean, I think I think we're finding that uh, Tom Harrison is at the forefront of that. Um, his book, Have a Civilization, was uh, published by Glantz, who I've been finding is running an intelligence cell as, uh, along the lines of your spies in academic clothing. Um, is there anything as particular you're trying to look for in my paper specifically I can look at? Um, well, no, not necessarily. I mean, well, you know, you just mentioned Gallant, so why don't we uh, start digging into him? Uh, that's a good segue point because uh, basically Gallant was Tom Harrison's publisher, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so it's it's a very he's a very key person, but. He's even more key than I think uh, any of us imagine. When you hit on this Gallant's character, it really wove everything in the top echelons all together. And let me just pull this up because uh, so here's Brigadier, Brigadier General Thomas Harrison, and we see him tied over here again to you know Gregory Bates and. Uh, Truby Davidson, etc. But you know, and, and then we see Skull and Bones there. Oops, that shouldn't be above uh, Thomas Harrison. I don't think he was a member of Skull and Bones. Sorry about that. I'll have to fix that later. But uh, so here's uh, Sir Victor Gonzalez, and he's a Fabian. He's a hardcore Zionist and communist, and he's you know uh, working directly with George Orwell or Eric Blair. Now, who did George Orwell work with? Well, George Orwell was a Fabian, and he worked with Aldous Huxley. In fact, he was Aldous Huxley's uh, student, and yeah, Aldous Huxley was his tutor. And he was tied in with Arthur Colster, whom I have exposed in my paper, Enthugens, What's in a Name? But uh, George Orwell was published by uh, this organization, the New Left Book Club, that was founded by Sir Victor Gonzalez. So why don't Gallant. you, your Gallant, so why don't you tell us about uh, uh, all of that history there? Okay, let me uh, just do a quick search on my PDF so I can pull that up here. 
Galants, and it's just uh, should I pull up? Uh, I mean, I already already read Orwell's letter about Galants to his uh, literary editor uh, last or literary agent last week. I don't know if you want me to reread that letter again. Well, just you know, give uh, people a fresh start. Okay. Well, um, just pull up Victor Galants next. There's a lot of Victor here, so apologies for as I have 32 pages to go through to find it. This is all very fresh in my head. Um, I know thinking on air is not the best thing for. <laughs> you you know, and, and Victor Galantz wrote Savage Civilization. Where did you want to dive in at? Yeah, see, I'm not, I'm not a podcaster or a YouTuber. This is my second time yeah. ever being on YouTube. So you got to apologize. I got to apologize in advance because I'm not very professional when it comes to presentation. <laughs> well, Especially just remember there's uh, like 50 people watching you pause right now. So you should probably say <laughs> something. <laughs> so it's, like you're, it's like trying to record or play a concert, you know, and your, 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 guitar, your guitar string breaks. Yeah. And now you're All right. trying to fix your guitar string. And well, let's get back to this. So uh, let's see. Now, where did I just put your notes? Dang it. Here we go. All right, so okay, well, so let's go end with, it. Uh, let's start with Orwell. Just go right with the primary citation. I just found All that right. letter actually. So I'll reread this again. Um, this is written to uh, to Mr. Uh, Moore, uh, Leonard Moore, who is his literary agent. It says, uh, "Here with the manuscript of the Road to Wigan Pier. Parts of it I am fairly pleased with, but I should think the chances of Gallant's choosing it as a left book club selection are small, as it is too fragmentary and, on the surface, not very left wing." Perhaps if it were sent on to him more or less at once, he might have a look at it or get someone else to do so before the Christmas holiday. But I suppose we are not likely to hear from him before I leave for Spain, which uh, you should, which should be in about a week. Gore sincerely, Eric A. Blair. Uh, there's a footnote in there. Um, this, uh, this appears right after the Left Book Club appears in the passage, and it states uh, the Left Book Club, founded by Victor Galantz in May 1936 and published by him, was an anti-fascist pro-Soviet, and for the Popular Front. Subscribers had to accept the monthly choice of the selection committee consisting of Victor Galantz, Harold Lasky, and John Strachey. By this time, the membership had reached 40,000. Uh, yeah, so, you know, and, you know, last year I did a couple shows discussing uh, publishers as intelligence cells. And again, we see this, we see it with uh, Overbook Press, The New Left. Uh, we discussed it with Trine Day and Park Street Press and Feral House, I suspect, and, you know, some of these others, uh, City Lights, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, these are, you know, all, all companies that I suspect are involved in this. But, uh, you know, so we have evidence of, for sure, of The New Left Book Club and then... Uh, you know, uh, all the attacks that we've had out of trying to, et cetera. But this guy, Harold Lasky, is another important one because he's also a Fabian socialist. All these guys are Fabians. And what we're seeing here is really how the Fabian society becomes, you know, and their, their logo is the wolf in sheep's clothing. And they really are behind promoting all of these eugenics against the population, all this disinformation, uh, promoting Zionism, etc. They create the London School of Economics, that creates the Rolling Stones, that creates the pop music, and on and on and on. They're, they're funding all of this through, through themselves. They help to found the Frankfurt School. Uh, we see Aldous Huxley is another Fabian. Of course, Aldous Huxley goes on to head... Uh, the be one of the key architects of the CIA's MK Ultra program that we've exposed so much of, but uh, all of this stuff is connecting through this Fabian Society, and now with this New Left book club, we're beginning to understand how they promoted all of the socialism and you know feminism, all of this stuff. Here, here we even see John B. S. Haldane. Well, who's he? He's the one that came up with the the famous quote that uh, Terence McKenna always spends. It isn't just stranger than you suppose, it's stranger than you can suppose. Well, John B.S. Haldane's uh, quote, uh, you know, John B.S. Haldane, uh, my own suspicion at the, that the, is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, it's, but it's queerer than we can suppose. And then, of course, we've shown Terence McKenna tied on into all of this and promoting his own line of eugenics and 
and uh, sterilization against males, et cetera, in previous shows, which is also found on my website and the articles on him. But all of this is coming out of this new left book club. And, you know, so a lot more of these authors need to be flushed out. You know, here's Arthur Colster again, and he uh, wrote The Ghost in the Machine that's, you know, so much cited in... Uh, uh, by Leary for pediomorphosis and use in uh, MK Ultra and uh, 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 basically mutating children to get them to adopt their ideas, etc. That's see, that's the, you just you just showed it. I mean, you could dive into this research and you can go in a million different directions. There's so much information that's out there that I mean, really anybody can go out there and find some information and tie right back into you and really, really expose a lot. Hey, I, I just found um, some more information in regards to uh, Galantz and uh, his interactions with George, <clears throat> George Orwell in particular. Um, this comes from a pretty good source. It comes from a review of, on the, uh, the Left Book Anthology. I just got to correct you really quick. It's not called the New Left Book Club. That's a recent incarnation that... Uh, oh, did I, did I con confuse those when I stated it? Yeah, oh, it's, I it's sure actually did. just the left book club. And I think your, your citation in the brain database calls it the new left book club yep. as well. It's corrected now, fixed. Okay. I just wanted to make, catch that real quick. Um, but going back to this uh, this passage I found from the left uh, left book anthology, let me see if I can find the author. I think I cited him at the bottom of this passage here real quick. I just want to give him credit. It's a long passage. Maybe I shouldn't read all of it. I'm just trying to see if I can find the, the best bits. But it's by uh, Gary McCullough. All right. And uh, I guess uh, we can kind of go into uh, John Strachey and Gonzalo Delance and his uh, editorial uh, prowess. So the Left Book Anthology brings together a number of extracts from Left Book Club titles. Paul Lady's introductory essay, he is a senior editor of the London Review of Books, sets the Left Book Club in context. He outlines the personalities of the principal characters especially the editorial triumvirate. Victor Galanz's energy and tremendous editorial skills are balanced against his intellectual crankiness and elitism. Harold Lasky is presented as a highly respected, uh, there's, a, there's a typo in their, in their copy here, so excuse me, as a highly respected Christian socialist professor from the LSE, and John Strachey as a snobbish upper-class Marxist with an undoubted gift for, po uh, for popular writing. And this is John Strachey, I believe, who is the son of the publisher, uh, Stracci, if I'm correct. Yeah, and you have a couple of good quotes in here about Stracci. Let me just read those really quickly. Sure, go ahead. Like, like all socialists, I believe that the socialist society involves in time to a communist society, John Stracci. And then, uh, and this one is, in American newspaper jargon, John Stracci would be described as Marxist number one, and the title would be well-deserved, and that's Left News, March 1938. <laughs> so a uh, lady uh continuing on with the article here a uh, lady also charts the starting the startling success of the club uh by the end of 1936 that's a key uh number right there you know we, uh, we should uh, you know what let me just mention too that the bolsheviks murdered 60 to 70 million people and that shouldn't be forgotten all of these people promoting all this marxist socialist uh crap communist crap you know, that resulted in 60 to 70 million people being murdered. So uh, just keep that in mind because, you know, these people, which, you know, it's very clear as well that the intelligence community, both British and U.S. and Soviet, and I'm sure others, are at the core, at the center of, pro of promoting all of this communist crap. And, oh yeah, this this cell is looking like you're right on the dot there. Yeah, you know, and you know, and I've been noticing this for a while that you know that the CIA was involved in promoting all of this uh, socialist <laughs> stuff, and really what McCarthy was battling against was the CIA. But um, you know, and and all of these, well, not just the CIA, but these occult groups and Zionism, et cetera, as well, all tied directly into this stuff. But. Yeah, it's very clear that the CIA, while, you know, one side of the government is promoting freedom and all, the CIA is there at the forefront promoting communist and socialist ideas out to the American public. You know, I mean, like 
look at the uh, MK Ultra program, look at all the hypersexuality, all of that stuff is actually leading to socialism because when you have people without families and extended families, they have to rely on government. They haven't set up a life for survival. They've set up a life for somebody else to take care of them. And the only answer for that is socialism and communism, you know, as the answer to their lazy behavior and not planning for their own lives. That's true. I mean, it's, it's kind of wicked. I mean, you can kind of see how weaponized anthropology fits into this because you can kind of see how the techniques from the jungles in Borneo go to the streets of the UK to Western society. In well, general. yeah, well, yeah, well, and look at how these anthropologists are going around studying these cultures to figure out how to break them and to, you know, and you, you, you shatter these ancient individual cultures and then you insert communism and, 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 you know, reliance in their stead. Mm -hmm. It's uh it's kind of sick. <laughs> it, it, not kind of, but it's def I mean, it's uh, not beyond kind of sick. It's disturbing. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, psychopathology on a, on a extreme level to say the least, you know, there's, so uh, there's actually I just saw it Reddit. I'm trying I was trying to find some information on Glantz and his editorial techniques and how he kind of acts. And um, let's see if I like pull this out. There's uh, a man by the name of Gary McCullough. He viewed Glantz's educational approach as preaching to and forging an educated elite, and even and has even described the domination of middle class intellectuals over the network as an agency of social control over the aspirations of the working class through middle class cultural hegemony. I mean, that's pretty loaded right there, but I mean, that kind of shows Galanz was definitely in interested in influencing society and putting his viewpoints out there. And that's what we see today, and everybody thinks they're individualistic and all, and yet they all got the same damn tattoos, you know, from the same pattern at the same tattoo shop and the, you know, the same gigantic ear holes and all of this stuff, and they, you know, and, you know, each group is wearing its uniform, the punk rockers and the deadheads and the ravers and the burners they all got their uniforms you know but they all think they're individuals that you know that they're behaving individualistically while they destroyed and are going along with the destruction of all of these cultures that were actually truly you know individualistic and and ancient and brought people all the way through time regardless of their differences it was what the difference the, the differences it was is what made them so unique and precious not this homogenization of the entire you know planet yeah it seems like self-determination has been kind of skewed into you know i'm going to be whatever i think i want to be and i'm not going to become you mean i'm going to be whatever the cia wants me to be and i'm going to exactly. think and i'm going to think that i'm being a, a rebel about it you know <laughs> exactly but really i'm just you know coming out of a cookie cutter and i look like everybody else and i have no individuality whatsoever no original ideas and really no family or structure anymore. I mean, it's kind of sad. You kind of look around and, you know, people in my generation don't get married as much. All uh, right. So you've got, you know, tons and tons of really good notes here. You know, it's it's fresh off the top of your head. Let's just, you know, start scrolling through it and, and dive into some of these. Um, you know, Gonzalez, uh, and Gonzalez, we should mention, ran the uh, Christian book club as well. And, Indeed. and and of course he was Jewish, by the way, and uh, he, he was considered himself a Christian socialist as well. Right, right. And let's According to Wikipedia. Let's uh, read that quote from him talking about Christians. You know, are not exactly bright. You want to go into that? Sure. I just got to search search for that really quick because um, there's the 32 page document. It's kind of hard to find. I this think stuff. it's on page eight. Page eight. Okay, and this is from John R. Coleman. So we kind of got to take it. The grain of salt because he doesn't like to cite his sources um okay i found the paragraph let's see if i could if there's any context be before it just real quick yeah just look right. you know just yeah, read sure. it it's all right so i'll just start from uh let's see oh, i just lost the screen <laughs> all right well you know it's <laughs> it says uh well, it's reported as saying christians are not exactly bright so it'll be easy for socialism to lead them down the garden path through their ideals of brotherly love and social justice. Fabian socialism targeted political, economic, and educational organizations in addition to the Christian church. 
Later, Galanz's left, left wing books gave special discounts to Christians who were interested in socialist ideas. On the selection committee of the left book club were Galantz himself, Professor Harold Lasky, and John Strachey, a Labour Party member of Parliament. Galantz, who also owned the Christian Book Club, was a strong believer in Bolshevik Russia as an ally of socialism. At the urging of Beatrice Webb, he published one of the Fabian Society's best sellers, Our Soviet Ally. Fabian socialism set out from the very beginning of its history to penetrate and permeate the British Labour and Liberal parties, and, as it turned out, also the Democrat Party in the United States. It was relentless in its zeal and energy to create feminist socialism, at which was to become highly successful. Socialism succeeded in gaining the ascendancy of school boards, town councils, and labor unions under the guise of bettering the lot of the working man. Fabian socialism's determination to capture education mirrors what Madame Zinoviev had long counseled in, Bolshe in Bolshevik Russia. And that pretty much ends. Yeah, that's, you goes. know, and that's really a doozy right there. Now, uh, you know, Gonzalez eventually his uh, Gonzalez LTD eventually goes on to be bought out by Orion Publishing Group. Who published Jason Horsley. Who published Jason Horsley, right. Indeed. Which is curious. I wonder if he knows that <laughs> yeah or if he understands Pro this information how it contacts back probably not research. but uh you know <laughs> that probably brings some questions into his mind for sure now notable names under this incarnation of imprint philip k dick mm -hmm. and, and now uh tessa dick his fifth wife lives a few blocks from me i don't you know if she's still alive i should probably look that up i haven't seen her around town for several months she may have uh have died now you know and we've done a lot to expose none other than jidu krishnamurti <laughs> and so you know jidu is right there in with this uh this whole group here so uh let me just pull this up on the in the brain database here but jidu was working directly with aldous huxley and you know he was one real dirty you know son of a bitch to say the least but you know, he encouraged people, knowledge helping man to his sins seems so, so utterly knowledge uh, nonsense to me. But uh, he went on to, you know, he was basically in the promotion uh, of the idea that uh, thinking was bad and you shouldn't care to know things. But this is all of this operation that was being promoted by Aldous Huxley and the CIA. We see that Jiddu Krishnamurti also knew Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, of course, was working with the CIA, created, you know, the hero's journey that I've exposed with Steve Outram. Uh, Joseph Campbell was behind Stanford Research Institute's Changing Images of Man, version one. He was the man in charge of that organization or that uh, project. Of course, uh, CIA agents Willis Harriman, James Fadiman, Carl Rogers, B.F. Skinner, Margaret Mead, uh, Ralph Metzner, Sir Julian Huxley, uh, Stanley Krippner, all of these agents uh, and participants as CIA assets were a part of this project. But, uh, you know, so this is how all of this stuff, you know, directly ties together. You know, we're just a few clicks away and we're right back to the Fabians. Here we are, Aldous Huxley again, you know, and then we get right back to the Esalen Institute and the CIA's MK Ultra program. It's, you know, one click away. So the Fabian Society. This British organization is really key behind the promotion of all these ideas. You know, we have John Maynard Keynes, the economicist. He's uh, working with the, the Fabians and um, working with, uh, I think he was working with the London School of Economics as well and the New School for Social Research. And then here we're right back with the Fabian Society again. So, you know, this Fabian Society really is central, as well as this publishing company that uh, that uh, Jacob has found in, in tying yeah. all of this together. This really seems like sort of a almost a, an intelligence community nexus, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems like we're kind of getting the crowbar in the door and we're starting to open it wide open. Um, especially with connections to the Fabian Society and Galantz, there actually is one um, I found in a footnote in a in a essay about Robert Carlyle by a Freemason. Um, 
And in his footnotes, he mentioned that uh, one of the uh, most reliable biographies of Robert Carlyle up until 1983 was written and pu- was written for and published by the Fabian Society and Victor Gallant's. And if you they, look at they the, just they just put it right in all of our faces. You and know? if you if if you look up the Gallant's LTD um, logo, I have it on my paper, but it's right. also on the Gallant's Wikipedia. If I'll see if I up, I'll see if I can pull it up here in your paper. I remember seeing it, so I'm just it. scrolling to it. Hey, everybody, excuse us. So people are no, gonna laugh when they see the symbol. <laughs> Where am I looking now? I may have gone past it already. It should be. It's probably pretty recent. It's going to be close to the uh, LTD Wikipedia. I'm not seeing it. I'm just paged. Oh, here this. it is. All right. So what page are you on? It's okay. On it's uh, it's on page five. All right. So what is the, the VG symbol? Is the G symbol? What is that for Freemason? That's what it kind of seems to me. But if you look at the V, it almost kind of reminds me of the apron. The way, the way it's shaped and uh, it folds over the apron of the, yeah. uh, the Freemason as well. And I see yeah. that G, it also reminds me of that. So I, I kind of see that symbolism and it reminds me of the in-your-face kind of symbolism that these kind of types like to do. I can't verify it because there's no you know, you know, Masonic medallion that's like that unless somebody can offer an example that shows that. But Victor Gallant's VG. It also has apron fold kind of imagery inside of it. It's just curious. It's something to look at. Might not go anywhere, but it's something worthy of consideration at the very least. At the very least. All right, so let's go into some more of this stuff here. Let me pull this off the, the view here. All right, so uh, now who else is published by this guy? Um, you know, oh, what I wanted to mention is that he also is so-called predicts the six million Jews during World War II. Now, of course, other scholars, I had somebody on, now I'm forgetting his name. It was, what, four or five years ago, at least, maybe six years ago. And he had looked at research into that, uh, tracing that myth back to the, eight, I think, 1889 or 1890 in the New York Times. Wow. This number of six million Jews being persecuted in Russia. But uh, it's, I think it's a Kabbalistic number. But uh, this the six million had been reported, you know, long before the 1930s. It was always reported six million, six million Jews being persecuted here or there. So then, uh, Galan's he uh, predicts. Uh, and when did he predict this? What year was it? Do you remember? It was in the 1930s, right? It was but in he, the 1930s. This is before. Well, actually, I think it was he, maybe he, 1940. Yeah, but he predicts it essentially like. 50 some years after the New York times predicted it. And then, you know, and all of the stuff floating around from the 1880s, 1890s about it. And I'm pulling this off the top of my head, but if I remember the Wikipedia uh, article about this and their notes on it correctly, him making this prediction helped propel him and gain credibility within the publishing and intellectual communities because it showed that he was visionary. So just kind of humorous that this, you know, he's a visionary man for predicting these, this thing, which had been predicted quite a bit by certain right. people well, over the years. D- and so you f- did you find evidence of him uh, tied directly to Alan Dulles by chance? Um, the connection that I have to him, to Alan Dulles, is um, this is kind of where a thought experiment kind of took me uh, after last show because uh, we always talk about lifetime actors. Right. And we, and we, and, looking at Tom Harrison. And if you actually look in Savage Civilization, uh, let me just look up the chapter really quick. I have the book handy. It's called uh, Hollywood Ho Ho, page 424. Um, bef- before he leaves the New, New Hebrides, uh, he meets uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Mary Astor, who uh, approach him on a yacht and uh, take him for a little trip, and they want him to film uh, the Savages uh, for a Hollywood movie. Uh, so they left their cameraman with him after whining and dining and giving him visions of becoming a star, which he was very much into. Uh, he kind of found it laughable how the director who was there was shooting and um, basically trying to make the natives act anything but their natural selves. And he thought that was just kind of appalling. You know, like, why are you, why are you trying to depict reality through your narrative when that's, your narrative is not the reality? It's complete fiction. 
So I'm starting to think about that. I'm like, okay, so the Hollywood at this point to Tom Harrison is just complete fiction. People are very obviously acting and they're trying to portray their own visions in their work. What happens around this time in the 1930s? And this is um, actually where Stanis or Konstantin Stanislavski dies. And that's, I, I believe he dies in 1936 and Savage Civilization is published in 37. So this is kind of where the Stanislavski system and method acting arises. And this is kind of where a lot of my paper kind of goes into. Because um, I wanted to kind of see how total immersion anthropology kind of fits in with total immersion method acting. And they actually kind of have a lot of really good connections. They kind of seem to mix very well, especially when in, in terms of ethics, because to become totally immersed without letting your subjects know that you're there is quite unethical, especially if you're, you know, injecting chaos and subversion. Um, plus, you know, people can lose trust after that in psychological aspects. So I started looking into that and I was trying to figure out who were some of the most prominent uh, educators of the Stanislavski system and um, how this might turn into lifetime actors. Because you can look at examples like Marlon Brando or Dustin Hoffman, or uh, more currently Sir Daniel Michael Blake Day Lewis. Uh, <laughs> it's a fantastic actor, by the way. Um, so I started looking into that, who, who are the educators? And I found a book published by Victor Galantz called The Stanislavski System by uh, Sonia Moore. And that kind of got my curiosity going. I was like, who's this Sonia Moore? She's not really uh, listed in any of the uh, major literature on Wikipedia or by a lot of the prominent authors like to write about method acting because uh, she's listed as a Stanislavski expert and somebody who's been in his tra training and understanding his system and learning and expanding it for over 30 years. Um, so. I did a couple of searches and I found her obituary in the New York Times from 1992. And in this obituary, there's a very interesting little piece at the bottom. And uh, that was that uh, Sonia Moore was married to a man by the name of Leon Moore. Now, I'm going to have to pull this up really quick because I want to get his real name correct. Here, let me, uh, I've got it here in the database too. Oh, great. Could you pull it up for me? Because I kind of feel awkward going through all this. Yeah, dude, you need to get yourself a database going. So uh, here's <laughs> Sonia Moore, and now he was, uh, she was married Actually, to this guy, it. Lev, Lev Borisovich he Helfond. Yes, and then he changes his name to Leon Moore. Yes, and now Leon Moore became an advisor to Alan Dulles when he was the director of Central Intelligence. Uh, Sonia Moore was the founder and leader of the American Center for Stanislavski Theater Art and the Sonia Moore Studio of the Theater. Um, she died in May 1995 at her home in Manhattan. Now, and she was uh, behind, uh, wasn't she behind or authored the Stanislavski system? Uh, she did. She authored a few books on uh, Stanislavski. Um, the Stanislavski system, I actually just picked it up, but I think it's over in my living room on my couch. So I'm not going to go run over and grab it. <laughs> read. I mean, I've, I, I dove into that the other night, read about a couple chapters, and it's fascinating. I mean, her idea of, I mean, it's, it's worth reading. Um, but just to go back to Helfand really quick, just so you can understand his relationship and how understand where he comes from and why maybe Alan Dulles would hire him, of all people, as an advisor. You know, you talk, think about advisors, right. you think about that man who was in your ear giving advice. Why is that? Right. So, so Helfand, the second secretary responsible for Leah, uh, actually, I think I'm going a little bit too far here. I'm going to read the entire footnote just so we can get the context of where this guy's coming from. This is from Stalin's agent, The Life and Death of Alexander Orlov by Boris Volodarsky. This is uh, footnote number four. I'm going to butcher the Russian name, so please, my apologies. I don't speak Russian, so I, I just don't have those qualities. I can speak Dmitry a little Prokhorov. Slavic. I can help you out there. Dmitry Prokhorov, Soloko Stoit Prodat Rodino. That's the name of the book and author, I believe. Uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Neva, 2005, pages 146 to 8. Uh, he says, uh, several authors, uh, ergo Vladimir uh, Burtsev, Paul W. Blackstock, including Prokhorov, claim that both Aarons, the embassy counselor responsible for contacts with the PCF, and Helfand, second secretary responsible for the liaison of the Russian Emirate organizations and their press, uh, were directly involved. Uh, and this was, uh, I believe, with a kidnapping that occurred in Paris in the 19. I'm going to get the date wrong. I think it was the 1920s. Uh, we're directly involved. According to Prokhorov, Helfand was the OGPU agent recruited in 1926 when he was sent to Paris. Uh, without documents, it is impossible to say whether Helfand was or was not an agent, but he was certainly a co-optee. 
In 1926, he was sent to Paris to learn French and get some experience in diplomatic work. In May, he married a Russian-American actress, Sonia Moore, and after six months, was appointed vice counsel at the Soviet legation. Soon, he was promoted to second secretary and moved with Sonia to the legation premises. Prokhorov claims that Ahrens left Paris on the 26th of January, 1930, i.e., immediately after the abduction. And you have to go into the book to kind of understand where that abduction ties in. Uh, abduction ties, uh, ties in. <clears throat> excuse me. And Hell found on the 28th of January um, left. Other, other independent sources um, see Felicia Hardison, Stanislav, Stanislavski's champion, Sonia Moore and her crusade to save the American theater, uh, theater history studies, 1st of June, 2004. That's a book I need to get. Uh, confirm that they came to Moscow in February 1930, and this quick retreat from Paris after their Kutupov operation does not look too good for Helfon. However, in Moscow, he served as assistant director of the Anglo Romance Department of the NKID, and in 1935 was appointed first secretary of the Soviet embassy in Rome. There, he and his American wife spent four years secretly preparing for defection. In the meantime, he was promoted to charge d'affaires. And in 1940, they both managed to defect to, defect to the United States, where Helfon changed his name to Leon Moore. Born in the on 29th of December 1900 near Poltava in central Ukraine, Lev Borisovich Helfond or Leon Moore became an advisor to Alan Dulles, and that kind of connects back to where we started with this. So, the man is dirty, <laughs> and he's very experienced with uh, ambassadorships and embassy work and working with other agents and being in the ear of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. But he's a defector. Mm -hmm. right. not, you know, he's not colluding with anybody there, you know. His wife well, publishing you know. her galants in his left book club, uh, Imprint Galants LTD. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you found some really amazing stuff reading through all of this. This guy is really, this, this uh, you know, publishing house, this left book club, and I didn't even get half these guys flushed out yet, but this is, you know, these guys are very obviously British intelligence. And then there's so much collusion between them and then and what the CIA have been promoting with the MK Ultra program, et cetera. I mean, there's so much collusion here that it really... Uh, appears that, you know, that we're looking at the same group. I mean, here's mm -hmm. George Orwell and then the Fabians, and then that goes into H.G. Uh, Wells and Aldous Huxley, and that goes over to, uh, you know, Edward Bernays, who was working in the U.S. with Gordon Wasson and uh, Aldous Huxley working with Timothy Leary and King Kesey. I mean, you know, here's this, this uh, one-eye Illuminati guy, running this whole mind control program and you know nobody suspects that he was one of the key guys behind this whole operation you know but he's you know at the Macy conferences behind this stuff he's you know he's I, I started writing an article uh, a couple years ago called where's Aldous Huxley <laughs> based on that <laughs> based based on uh the you know the where, where's waldo cartoon skip books you know where you have waldo in a different place and you know and you got to find him you know but he's like in every in every uh you know drawing so you know it's like aldous huxley is always there you just have to find him or you know if it's not aldous it's julian or it's you know francis huxley or thomas you know there's always a huxley there and with uh, with uh, just our example today with Galantz, I mean, you were talking about Judo Krishnamurti. I don't think we actually mentioned it, but you know, he encouraged uh, or Huxley encouraged Krishnamurti to write that book, and that's what put Krishnamurti on the forefront. Right. And if you go on Wikipedia and you look at the publishers of that book, the first UK edition was printed by Galantz. You know, with the forward by Huxley. So you, you, you there's your tie to Huxley to Galantz right there. I mean, it was, it well, was it's it's a forward. It doesn't, you know, I mean, you know, see, he, here's the issue is that well, uh, could have, well, Jidu could have requested that forward himself directly and had that prepared before it was ever submitted to Galance's, you know, so we can't speculate that that ties yeah, Huxley directly to it, you know. And I, I think the Wikipedia article also mentioned that didn't mention Galance as the publishing company where he introduced him to, but I think it was Harper Collins. 
Yeah. So it had to be through HarperCollins to probably uh, organize with Gallants to get it published over in the UK for their edition. So there's probably a connection there somewhere, but I don't know how, how, how much it is or where it can go. All this right, way. so we, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, where from oh. here? Oh, uh, well, I mean, we're, let's see. Uh, we were talking about Stannis Glossy's system, um, and you mentioned the MK Ultra, and this is kind of the road I'm kind of going down right now. Yeah, well, what's this? Uh, this he had like a map or something. Is that this big proposed Super Fifteen Super Task thing? Yeah, that's something I haven't mastered the Stannis Glossy system, so that's something I can't really um, give people a, a full understanding and account of. Okay, uh, well, let's let me. Should I show the image on screen oh, for them? Yeah, please do because it's an interesting right. image. It's definitely all right. Movie. So, so here's the image here. Let me just try to blow it up there a little bit and that's on the wikipedia page uh, you're, you're cutting out there jacob hello 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 i lost you jacob hello you still there am i still there yep you're back sorry okay. about that folks yeah, all right sorry. yeah just Cut keep out. going yeah i'm on i'm on wi-fi because the i'm on a on a a computer that doesn't have a dongle to connect the ethernet into the dongle into the computer so apologies that's, yeah that. that's uh yeah that's such, such a brilliant thing that they took that off of computers it's baffling yeah but, so uh, all right it, so it, go it, ahead allow me to borrow this computer to the one who let me borrow this computer <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> not complaining <laughs> all right so um the stanislavski system and uh, mk ultra so i'm looking at you know tom harrison and his total immersion behavioral aspects, you know, becoming the character and how, you know, becoming the character was such an stark contrast, savage civilization where the director is trying to make the character, the, the real people become his character. So under this system, there are no actors. I actually have an article from, I think it was the New York Film uh, University where they, uh, they finished the article about method acting saying, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have it drawn up in my paper, um, that the the the, the method of act, method acting is that there's no acting at all. I mean, you're just being. So if you're so it's if like you're the foundation a, of reality TV in a way. Yeah, and that's the foundation for lifetime actors. Because if you're going to be somebody that's out there who's going to pose as an intellectual like Aldous Huxley, and you know try to gain trust, you know you have to understand your audience, you have to understand your target, and you have to understand who you are. So what better way to do that than to psychologically enter the mind? and become the character you know go into deep deep thought consider all the sources i mean it seems like there's a lot of trivium that's kind of mixed into this as well because you have to gather a lot of grammar and then you have to think about it logically and then you need classical to present yourself authentically. Yeah. Classical, yeah, authentic, trivium. Yeah, classical trivium but but present yourself authentically as that character so when you look at mass observation and you look at how that kind of starts when tom harrison gets out there you know he wants people to blend in with the british public he wants them to observe listen into conversations and not get noticed because he wants everything to be authentic. He wants to be able to see the British public as they are. But uh, he also injects agents into this as well to gather information. Um, so I, con I consider this, I consider the anthropological, anthropological approach of um, complete participation. And then you look at that through um, the method acting and it just seems like it just kind of fits together. I'd like to find um, some of the psychologists who work with these early actors to kind of see if how they might tie to MK Ultra. I'm sure there's some MK Ultra do MK Ultra doctors that are tied to Hollywood stars who did method acting. The I was watching uh, on the Wonderfront over the weekend. Uh, I have the Criterion Collection version, and there's a documentary on there. And in this documentary, I'm going to get the title wrong, but if you have the movie, you can look it up very easy. It's basically on method, and it talks about the famous scene where um, I'm going to get one of the actors' names wrong, but uh, it's basically where uh, Marlon Brando is talking to his brother, brother Charlie, and Charlie pulls a gun on him in the car. And it's, it makes a spontaneous scene where Marlon Brando, instead of jerking back violently like you would expect in Hollywood, you know, expresses shame. And he goes, oh, Charlie, and he grabs the gun very gently and just kind of pats it aside. And that completely revolutionized the way film was kind of uh, portrayed. But one of the things that was really interesting that caught my attention was that... Um, the other actor couldn't really finish the scene with Brando because he had to leave every day at 4 p.m. to talk to his analyst. And the way they kind of just kind of brushed this aside in the movie was that Marlon Brando's mother had died and he was deeply depressed. But uh, I think that depression wasn't just because his mother died. It kind of carried around with him for quite a while before that. And I think after 
I'm curious who his, who his analyst was. I couldn't find the name of it. I did a lot of research, but I, I haven't flushed it out yet. I know it's possible to flush it out. I'm sure there's a book out there that's written about Brando that talks about it, but I just haven't found it yet. But I think there's some MK Ultra ties right there. I mean, this this could be where the lifetime actors come from. You know, you have the stars that are rising up, but then you also have the uh, the intellectuals who sense of it. self, general theatrical, outer theatrical sense of self, inner theatrical sense of self, uh, feeling, will, mind, embodiment, experience. Yeah, so this looks like a map of possibly of being a lifetime actor, essentially. It's very curious. Yeah, it's very, very curious. So, you know, and I wonder if uh, this Stanislavski method is, you know, what we've been calling lifetime actors for, you know, several years per Joe's term. Indeed. And as you proceed further in my paper, I mean, there's more detail that kind of goes into that. Um, just quotes, um, articles. I mean, even there's even a book about cultural observations and uh, t talking about using, and there's a chapter, there's only one chapter that I could find from the book, uh, but it was about method acting. You know, if you're going to go and you're going to be an anthropologist or a cultural observer, whether it's to change a society or, or to just observe and study it, you know, they give all the different methods of method acting that you could do to go in that society and blend in based on, you know, how you want to do your research and how ethical you Absolutely. want to be. Absolutely. You know, and uh, this goes back to, uh, you know, me calling the CIA the Central Entertainment Agency and stating that all these actors, et cetera, were, were agents. Now it's beginning to make sense, you know, and obviously an actor is somebody who takes up a role as someone else and is lying about who they are. And if they're good at it, you can't really tell that they're, you know, faking the whole thing. Mm-hmm. There's a, actually, there's a passage from, I just went to the bottom of the paper to read that, that final passage. Uh, it's called Complete Participant in Method and Method Acting for Cultural Ob Observation. This reminds me of Tom Harrison to the T. Well, and, and, you know, wouldn't it also Gordon Wasson? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's just because of the, he's so fresh in my mind with savage civilization and becoming, right, right. Going, going from a complete introvert who never talked to any of his classmates and cataloged them and followed their hierarchies to totally socially immersing himself with cannibals. So he was studying his classmates so that he could manipulate them. Mm -hmm. That's what it seems like. But then he goes into, you know, Borneo and into New Hebrides and he just becomes one of them, you know? So he considers the society he grew up in a savage, but the people who are eating their own kind are some of the best that are out there. <laughs> Very weird. So this complete participant, um, just before, actually we only have like three minutes left. Um, yeah. In this final role, you become fully involved without letting members know of your observation efforts. Now, obviously, Tom Harrison couldn't do this in the New Hebrides because he was white man, not acting white. But you could do this in mass observation. Uh, the implications include the following. You have reduced objectivity due to high involvement and have a high level of insight due to identification with members. Possible ethical problems would uh, ensue because of lack of notification of research subjects, depending on purposes of the observation. For example, if you dropped in on meetings without informing those present that you were also there to evaluate and report their behaviors, then your efforts would be judged unethical because of the potential harm that could result to those present. This approach might also be inconsistent with protection of human subjects if you did not allow informed consent of your observation. This role is best when you have access to the organization and or when members lack of knowledge of your presence would not influence the ethicality of your research purposes. For example, as human resources, resources department manager, you could serve and lead more effectively if you gleaned insights about norms and rules through observation and meeting and rituals. Standard of protection, standards of protection of human subjects presented in the overview of this section are critical in cultural research as well. If you present a cultural study to the CEO of an organization, and your study inadvertently reveals rule breaking, rule breaking or violation of cultural norms, it could have serious career implications for individuals you study. One of the observation role options, complete participant, should stand out as a form of observation. Oh, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm reading the wrong one here. Every day, I don't think I want to read this one. Yeah, well, we're, uh, we, okay. we're just about out of time here, too. That's fine. Uh, we're at 759. Yeah, but I mean, this kind of goes to show that there's a lot of ethical issues with mass observation. Yeah, and with anthropology as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So, all right, uh, GnosticMedia.com, G-N-O-S-T-I-C Media.com. Please support the show. Also support Joe, CaesarsMessiah.com. Jacob, thank you so much. You don't have a website, correct? 
That's correct. But you can reach me at jacobdoolman at gmail.com. No spaces, no dots, just one full name. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank and, you for having uh, me. Yeah. Thanks for coming back. And, uh, you know, if you hit another big uh, well, let us know and we'll bring you back again. Sounds good. All right. Take, take care. care. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye.